It's Brian Preston, the money guy. The next one we're going to talk about, I almost feel embarrassed to bring this one up because, I mean, I, even in, in show prep, I was like, it seems weird to go from gold uh-huh. to beanie babies. But y'all are like, no, historically, that it's, is it's when this comes up. Happened. I mean, th- this is what, remember how I was talking about I had my Star Wars toys that I thought that I thought I just kept them, yep. wouldn't let my mom sell them in the garage sale. Like she sold all my leather basketballs and everything else without my knowledge. She knew to stay away from the Star <laughs> You're Wars. You're not still sore about that I, at I'm, all. I'm based pretty on bitter that. about that. There's <laughs> those nice basketballs being sold, but um, you know. And then we talked about trading cards. Mm-hmm. These are grown adults that were buying beanie Plush babies, and, bean and this is t- talking about a moment in time that value is fleeting. If you don't have a why or understand it. You can get yourself in, in in a pretty tough situation. So, surely you guys have heard of Beanie Babies, mm-hmm. and I think this is actually a story of be careful of being manipulated by somebody who has kind of an understanding of what drives human emotions. Yep. How do you maximize a market opportunity? Because that's exactly what you have with the creator of Beanie Babies. Because the biggest beneficiary of the whole Beanie Babies frenzy was the founder and creator of Beanie Babies because by the way he's still a billionaire. He's still a billionaire because So of this. so that's um and and I have his name on here. Ty it's, Warner. It's Ty Warner. Look you you, you see billionaire you memorize <laughs> names. I'm, you're better at that <laughs> just than in me. In case I'm ever in the like, grocery store and I meet somebody I can just pull it out real we, quick. I'm surprised you don't have the home address for Ty <laughs> Warner figured out. Just just in case. But it is one of those things where I think you got to give Ty a little bit of credit in the fact that he understood that what drives valuations and prices when you're trying to create a frenzy is you have to, once again, it's this term I've brought throughout this show, you have to create perceived scarcity. Right. You have to make it seem like, hey, I can't get this. So they would they would only sell so many Beanie Babies. They would make the price very affordable, but yep. they would only release so many that it kind of created, and they wouldn't sell them, and they'd put only certain models at different, different stores. parts of the country. You know, like you can still go get Beanie Babies right now at Cracker Barrel. I see them all the time. I have to keep, you know, slap my kids' hands off of them, <laughs> you know, when we're in there. So they're still out there, but he would put different suppliers would have different variations or mm-hmm. models. And then here's the brilliant part of what he did. Every so often, he would announce, we're going to retire this model. Mm-hmm. This design of... Stuffed animal will no longer be made, so you have a limited quantity that's available. And so you had a lot of people, not only was this already limited runs, you started having resellers that were buying yep. these things up as soon as they hit the marketplace, driving up the values, and it just got ridiculous. It turned into a full-on feeding frenzy. I mean, some of these would go for over $10,000 in the secondary market, something that would have cost a couple dollars in the store was really, really inflated, and it, and it actually got so so wild. I think that one one of the most memorable pictures, because I actually remembered this picture even before Daniel brought it up to us, one of the most memorable pictures that I remember ex- kind, of, kind of exhibiting how insane this Beanie Baby uh, frenzy was, was oh, this couple, uh, they're obviously they're uh, going through a divorce, and they are in divorce court, and they are basically doing a draft or a lottery to pick who gets which Beanie Baby. They were, this wasn't bank accounts, this wasn't real estate assets, this wasn't cars. They're choosing who gets which Beanie Baby because I guess they had to have assumed these things are and are going to be incredibly valuable, so I got to make sure that I chisel off the ones that I need to keep. Guys, what, what you can't see if you're listening to this podcast, everybody on YouTube sees it, but we have a picture right now with a Big stack of stuffed animals in a courtroom, mm-hmm. just drawn out. Just I can imagine out. there is a glad trash bag right <laughs> off to the side there where they just literally dump these things out on the floor. And then you have two grown adults on their knees sorting through, basically going one by one for stuffed animals. I mean, th- this is preposterous. I mean, it almost just seems bizarro. And I'm sure these two people, if we had them on right now, would be kind of embarrassed that this is where their life savings were. Now, what I like about being able to share the Beanie Baby example is this is one that came full circle and no different than Tulip Mania because what the sad part of this is is a lot of folks were certain that this was going to be their ticket. This was going to be the <laughs> thing that led them to wealth. And so they ended up dumping their entire life savings into Beanie Babies, into this collectible, into this thing they thought was going to be the future. And we all know the rest of the story. The values plummeted, and a lot of folks lost hundreds of thousands of dollars 
because they were banking on this being their get rich quick thing that just did not pan out. Now, look, I was able to make an excuse for tulips. Sure. Because I, I gave you the context that flowers and plants were exotic back in the day in historic terms. I still don't know what craziness kind of went over or, you know, or just thoughts went into people's minds mm -hmm. when they thought stuffed animals were going to be the ticket to their retirement. And we actually have historical context of what, what's this, the trio? This is the, the, the American trio. The American set. trio. I mean, and look at this. We got a zebra, we got a teddy bear, and we've got an elephant. Mm -hmm. So, man, is that, is that a little biased in the fact that, <laughs> that why isn't the first one a donkey? And it would to go with is the. That, I don't. I can't I, actually it, tell what that is. Maybe that is a donkey. But anyway, they're all just draped in red, white, and blue. And we can see in 1998, this American trio was worth thirteen hundred dollars. Yep. In 2021, you can buy this right now on eBay for five bucks. Yeah, and I think that's heartbreak because if you were the person who said who finally in 1998 you finally got your opportunity, you just happened to stumble across that person that was so kind that they let you in on the American Trio set that they had. They were going to let you take it off of them for a reasonable $1,300. You'd be sick today recognizing, man, what did I do? And again, we've said it over and over and over, you have to get back to the fundamentals. What was it that made this plush toy filled with... Uh, they're not. Were they filled with beans? Did they actually have beans in? Them? Or was it like little foam things? What it's made foam. them so valuable? Nothing other than the marketing of the guy that created it. The guy who came up with it came up with a beautiful marketing idea to create an illusion of something that was viable that didn't actually turn out to be very viable. This just hit me, and I don't know why I didn't bring this up in show prep. Is I've actually overpaid for a beanie baby. <laughs> And, and let me no, let me tell you, because there's a lot of parents that understand when your kids are born, you get given gifts, um, you know, of stuffed animals and other things. And you don't know what thing your child will take a shine to. And that's the thing that they have to sleep with every night. My oldest child, who's now 17 years of age, still sleeps with her beanie baby. Is that right? I mean, it's still, I mean, she doesn't need it. Like, right. She, goes to, like, she was uh, just at bed, a friend's right? house. Yeah. But it's on the bed, yep. this dilapidated 17-year-old bean baby. Well, when she was like three years old, we went to a neighbor's house and she took this thing everywhere. It's even in family photos. It's dropped it and the neighbor's dog just ripped it to shreds. <laughs> and so I went on a hunt for... Three different versions of this doggy trying to convince my daughter that this was, was the, the same, same one, right? stuffed animal. And I guess it was somewhat popular. I didn't get this for three or four dollars. I paid, I think the most I ever paid for a doggy was like 25 bucks. Oh, but but wow, no, that's... love has no boundaries you know trying to get, get a it. child to sleep at it. night. And she still has. So I, I totally wasn't putting two and two together. That, that You know what? That stupid. Well, that awesome stuffed animal that my daughter still has <laughs> is actually a beanie baby uh -huh. that I got captured in that. But but there is something to be learned from this. It's the concept of if somebody's pitching that this is scarce, yep. that this is collectible, limited time, limited your supply. spidey senses should probably go off. Just like when you hear the, all the Franklin Mint commercials, mm -hmm. I'm always like, come on, they've been selling Franklin Mint stuff my <laughs> entire life. It's probably not going to be worth any more than what they're selling this gift set. Yep. Just pay attention. There's something to be learned from that.